nine second Academy Awards, fresh off last year's win for Into the Spider-Verse, they made an interesting change to the best animated feature category. First would be to drop the eight featured requirement for the slot to be active, and for nominations to be open to those in the short film and animation branches. So when the nominees were announced, two of the five were from mainstream film companies. The winner for the category, Toy Story 4, and How to Train Your Dragon 3. The others were organ-based studio Leica's The Missing Link, Netflix's I Lost My Bonnie, and a simple holiday film called Klaus. <laughs> Animation diehards were virtually obsessed with this tiny feature when it came out, winning audiences around the world with its wholesome and vibrant telling of the Santa Claus story. Despite not winning the Academy Award, which was going to be hard since that category is notoriously named the Pixar Award for good reason, it has a very strong following. Whether it be its touch to 2D animation or its timeless story, it is on many people's lists as being one of the best animated Christmas films of all time. And since it's coming around to its second year running, I want to put my two cents into that. When I first saw the film, I went in initially with a very cynical mindset. Oh, it's going to be like those old Rankin Bass or some other sappy, toothless holiday film that is just another made-for-market movie for little kids. And by the end of the movie, I actually fell in love with it. I didn't quite understand it the first time viewing. It was going beat by beat like any other holiday feature, but it was almost like there was more to it. Like a chemical reaction was slowly being mixed in, as it got closer and closer to the end, and then it finally got to me. There were some corny scenes and plugins, but they could be isolated from the entire film altogether. I wanted to talk about it when it came out, but by that time, the holidays were over, and I was too busy with my year-end video and vacation to even talk about it. So in the spirit of the holidays, I've decided to discuss what made this film a true holiday classic for me, and hopefully for many others as the years go by. The film in question is Klaus, a traditional Christmas film that gives a fuck. The plot of Klaus centers around Jesper, a mailman voiced by Jason Schwartzman, who has been recently kicked out of his family's estate to work at the post office in a fishing village called Smyrnsburg. Its biggest problem has to do with the local populace being split into two families that do nothing but feud, fight, and attempt to murder one another every day for what seems like centuries. Only one man has lived away from all this, and his name is Klaus, a woodsman who has crafted thousands of toys by hand, yet with no child to play with them. So Jesper and Klaus make an arrangement to give all the village's kids their toys for free in order for Jesper to make his quota and get back to his lavish lifestyle. So the entire plot is nothing too complicated to understand and doesn't stray away from the lighthearted tone and structure of most animated holiday films, but here is what Klaus has that others lack. It made old and outdated styles still feel relevant and fresh. Like the animation, which you would assume to be CGI like most holiday films are nowadays, but is not. But before I get into the technicals, there is a little bit of background that needs to be explained. Near the apex of the 2000s, 2D animation was slowly being driven out of mainstream media with the breakthroughs in the third dimension. 3D animation. And while the decline of 2D could be the poor marking decisions of studios or their frequent battles with executives behind the scenes, films like Finding Nemo and Shrek were making it rain like Little Wayne. The techniques incorporated into these films, such as lighting and realistic texture, were found to immerse audiences more than the flat, unrealistic drawings of the past. It also didn't help that 2D films like Treasure Planet and Sinbad were some of the biggest flops in animation history. And while 2D didn't necessarily go away, it has since been relegated to small productions and more importantly, television. One of the veterans of that 2D animation age was Sergio Pablos, 
who would later leave the comforts of 2D to work on 3D films like Rio, Smallfoot, and his most popular, the Despicable Me franchise. But Klaus proved to be his most ambitious project in his career, as from the initial reactions, every cinephile thought that he was wanting to revitalize interest in 2D animation. However, that is not the case. The point we've been trying to make is not that 2D is better or worse or 3D is. Mm -hmm. The point we're trying to make is that if the job is to engage an audience, uh, how does it matter how you accomplish that, right? So that's really, so I'm okay with people not knowing. It's fine. I want the film to be judged as a film, not, not as a 2D film. What Sergio and the team at his animation studio wanted to do was figure out a way to overcome the shortcomings of 2D, aiming to get away from what he calls characters looking like stickers on a painted background. So to do this, they used tools crafted by French company Poisson Rouge to create volumetric lighting and texturing to make the drawings look more organic. This not only keeps the genuine and unique style of 2D, but also makes the characters grounded in that world, a more cost-effective alternative to the subtle realism of stuff like Miyazaki's work. An example of how this works wonders the film style is in the scene where Jesper is approached by Alva in her dimly lit schoolhouse, surrounded by fish and crushed dreams. Going from scene by scene, the first few or so frames shine a light onto the picture of a recently graduated Alva with her degree in education a bright future. Then when Alva pops up, she has lost her optimism and looks dirty and tired, a dark reality. She approaches the terrified postman with a knife taken from a globe holding other knives, a representation of the town's hostility to logic and educated reasoning. As she rambles about her predicament to Jesper, she cuts a line holding her merchandise, something she doesn't view as valuable despite the overall value she placed on the product. And as she closes in on our stumbling main character, the full view of the schoolhouse is illustrated in a messy and dust-covered disarray of fish guts and a loss of identity. Finally, the shot where Jesper and Alva see eye to eye directly correlates what Jesper could become if he fails in his postly duties, lit exactly alike and tying their face together. The animation of Klaus is not an attempt to revitalize the 2D animation style, but to fix what was lacking from that style and bring it to a new light, literally. 3D is still used for many of the shots that were too complicated to hand animate, but it never overshadows the full feature. It keeps to its design philosophy quite nicely and provides probably the best background artwork of any animated film set in the north. The hostile and grey town of Smyrnsburg, the natural beauty of the ice scapes home to a small Sami tribe, and even the forest clearing housing the titular Klaus, all given a fresh new coat of paint through the crew's attention to detail. So what you had um, all of a sudden was that the same logic of what makes 2D appealing, which is like is um, not perfect because it's done by hand and there's there are people making judgment calls and everybody has their own style. Uh, that now was happening all the way through Final Color. Uh, so um, so I think that charm carries through. If he had been on an automatic system, uh, it wouldn't have looked uh, quite so interesting. When I mentioned that Pablos was working with past ideas and works, I already touched base on the animation that gave it its reputation but not its storytelling, that it is a Santa Claus story. And with it comes its own bit of divisiveness. All right, and now for the tricky part. Santa Claus is something of a holiday icon in Christmas, even more so than Jesus Christ, which only speaks of the amount of power capitalism has had over the past century. There are dozens of films, television shows, books, and more that center around this beloved home invader delivering presents to kids. However, the more you see of something, the less effective it has over time. So the idea of a Santa origin story seems to be a fairly difficult bridge to cross correctly. The way Sergio and his team managed to make this telling of his origins magical was to make it 
not so magical. Sure, there are fantastical elements, like the winds around Klaus pointing him to where he needs to go. It mostly centers around the postman Jesper, which is a novel idea. In fact, history has shown how much letters in the post office have meant to spark the imagination for generations. A good example would be Santa Claus, Indiana, and his post office during the 1920s. The magic of sending a letter to Santa Claus is the most common attribute to his long-standing pop culture image, and one that also recognizes the importance of the postal service, something our main character doesn't quite understand. Jesper is self-centered, spoiled, and petty, traits that his father, a postmaster general, finds unappealing and detrimental to the family business. In the first half of the film, Jesper's special privileges are taken away and is forced to become more independent in his life, which he, of course, tries to get out of. Much like his father, Klaus also pushes him to perform his duties to deliver the packages to those who need it, in this case, children. Soon enough, Jesper does start to see things more down to earth, opposed to when he was lounging around in his garbs at the beginning of the movie. Klaus, on the other hand, is not as outgoing or animated as Jasper, a quiet and imposing woodsman whose own personal problems have isolated him from the rest of society. He hides himself in his stockpile of toys in his large shed, and goes about his days making birdhouses as a memento to his late wife. Despite being the force of change in Jasper's development, he is too socially awkward to play the role that the children dreamed he would be. Jesper tries to use Klaus as a means to fulfill his quota of delivering packages, but by realizing the trauma and heartaches of people around him and attempting to mend them, he revitalized their passions. When these two opposite characters meet, Klaus looms over Jesper like a giant bear, territorial and ominous. When the child gets a toy frog for the first time and Klaus watches him from the window, he unveils himself with a slight reflection of the lantern's flame. The more times Klaus goes on runs with Jesper, who, by the way, does the delivery for him, the less we see of Klaus's frightening figure, instead revealing a very humble man who is finding purpose again, leading to his final transformation into the jolly red imagery we know of the classic character, with a Sami touch. There is a constant saying that Klaus keeps close to heart, that resonates with the film's message. A true selfless act always sparks another. The story is also not just about Jesper and Klaus's friendship, but the cause and effect that starts to liberate, or in the antagonist's eyes, infect the town's beliefs. In the beginning of the film, many of the town's clans are run on tradition, long legacies of hatred for the other, and it's because of that legacy that people are rotating a perpetual loop of misery and toxicity, and why the children of Klaus are very much an important contrast to the adults. We can go back to the scene where Jesper and the old ferryman head into the town for the first time. There is a scene where two old ladies are carrying what seems to be a dead body into the other home while another act is being committed outside, with a friendly looking snowman being impaled by carrots from a creepy set of kids. In many ways, this shows how the children are more or less the product of their family's upbringings. Other options don't seem to get past them, like the local teacher turned fishmonger, and with nothing but a bell to incite their bloody passion, the kids are on their way to become just like their forefathers. Until they start receiving gifts from Jesper and Klaus, revealing that they are just the victims of a generational circumstance. The one thing the children possess is an active imagination, and whenever they receive gifts and believe they saw Klaus, they start these out-of-mind tales like that he goes down chimneys and can fly, and that if you're naughty, you only get coal. That last one also serves to push the kids to start behaving themselves, initially for material items, but then to see the approaching change of character that takes place in the town. This gets the attention of the adults who, with the exception of their leaders, begin to spread the Yuletide cheer and goodwill to their neighbors. Each important point in the plot also reignites every integral character to a passion they once wanted to distance themselves from. Jesper didn't want to be a postman, but when someone showed him kindness like Margu, a little Sami girl who can't speak English and is not given translation throughout the film, 
he starts to take appreciation for his 9 to 5 job. Klaus sees the joy he brought back to children, and gives him the motivation to keep on making toys for them. The children he could never have. Alva transforms both her image and her schoolhouse because of the children's desire for education. Even the villains by the end, that were tied down by a tradition, are forced to join hands in relativity when their kids become joined in matrimony. It's not just the theme of charity that helps Klaus' story, but also the idea of how fragile the boundaries of conformity can be broken by just walking a mile in someone's shoe and just listening to them. Charity, passion, and community are some of the biggest themes in Klaus. And while not too uncommon in many Christmas films, it works here because of its well-executed pacing and well-knit, well-done story structure. But I believe the best part of the film has to be where it concludes. And it's here where I'll be spoiling the last few scenes of the movie, so if you want to see the movie for yourself, I would suggest to skip to the time mark here. So near the end of the film, we see a very elderly Klaus chopping wood away in a spot where he met Jesper. He hears the sounds of the winds howling, the clattering of his wife's birdhouses, and then proceeds to say, I'm coming, love. He leaves behind the simple wooden axe, walks up the hill towards the yellowish rays of sunlight, takes one last breath, and is never seen again. The wind dies down, and everything goes still. With Klaus gone, the shop has been abandoned, and despite his best efforts to find him, Jesper never sees his friend again. Cut to years later, and after tucking his kids to sleep, he sits himself down and waits for the sounds of bells outside, believing it to be his old friend. There is a good reason why I wanted to leave the ending for last, and that is not due to the subtext of what it means in the end. In fact, by the way you will experience this film will be how you will interpret it years later. Movies around these festive traditions sometimes have a caveat to become blind to the authenticity of their filmmaking, and sadly, many have become prominent examples that stumbled into the cavern of mediocrity. But with Klaus, it is a rare specimen that earns its wings through dedication and charm, avoiding the cliff drop altogether. It's much like other films like Charlie Brown, The Grinch, or Tokyo Godfathers. These are works that hold on to the nostalgia of the time, while also being critical of the self-indulgent nature and greed of the holiday season. They change with each rewatch as we grow older, as they were never meant for a single group of people. Anybody can watch them during this time of year and come out with a whole new opinion of it. Now Klaus might not seem like it from a certain point of view. It does have some songs placed into it that feel unnecessary, including one called Invisible, that I don't think you'll be playing that often during the holidays. Its plot isn't overly complex, and while I admire the story for the elements it shines brightly in, there are some scenes that are either forced in for drama or to fill some sort of box. However, those are things that are minor fractions of the whole film, and don't disrupt it from what it wants to tell. And thus, like other ones I've mentioned, it understands the core component that all those films had, a heart. I can imagine right now that you're around my age, and have most recently just begun to form your own family, or connect your own loved ones. Animated Christmas films were most likely your nostalgic hook, because of its expression and love for the holidays. It made our everyday problems feel small when you can spend it with the ones you cherish. And given we are in dark times like this, and farther away from our loved ones, films such as Klaus are really important right now. Klaus is everything you want in a holiday film made for kids and adults. It has the comedy and wacky designs to keep kids entertained, but it also has the sentimentality and gorgeous animation for adults to keep invested. 
is the one film I find to not be completely swallowed up by the hallmarks of other more routine-based animated flicks, and despite some shortcomings, is the film I'll be watching every time I need just a little bit of winter magic. Thanks for watching everyone. I hope you enjoyed this video and sorry for such the wait. I am working on my year end list of my favorite anime and should be back with that very soon. It's your bra man signing off. <laughs>